It is easy to praise providence for everything that happens in the world, provided you have both the ability to see individual events in the context of the whole and a sense of gratitude. Without these, either you will not see the usefulness of what happens, or, even supposing that you do see it, you will not be grateful for it. If God had created colors but not the faculty of vision, colors would have been of little use. Or if God had created vision but not made sure that objects could be seen, vision would have been worthless. And even if he had made them both but not created light, then neither would have been of any value. So who contrived this universal accommodation of things to one another? Who fitted the sword to the scabbard and the scabbard to the sword? No one. In the case of artifacts, it is just this kind of symmetry and structure that regularly persuade us that they must be the work of some artisan instead of objects created at random. Do sword and scabbard testify to their creator, whereas visible things, vision and light together, do not? What about the desire of the male for sex with the female and their ability to use the organs constructed for that purpose? Don't they proclaim their creator too? All right then. What about the complex organization of the mind, built so that when we meet with sensible objects, we don't just have their forms impressed upon us, we make a selection from among them, and add and subtract impressions to form various kinds of mental combinations, and from certain ideas make inferences to others somehow related. Aren't such abilities able to make a big enough impression so that it becomes impossible for us to discount the possibility of a creator? If not, it's left to us to explain who made them and how such amazing and craftsmanlike abilities came into being by accident on their own. Are humans alone in possession of such skills? It's true that there are many skills distinctive to humans, skills that as a rational animal he uniquely needs. But the irrational animals share with man many of the same faculties. Do they also understand what happens? No because use is one thing, understanding another. God needed animals that use impressions, like us. He had special need of us, though, because we understand their use. And so for the beasts, it is enough to eat, drink, sleep, breed, and do whatever else it is that satisfies members of their kind. But for us, who have been given the faculty of understanding, this is not enough. Unless we act appropriately, methodically, and in line with our nature and constitution, we will fall short of our proper purpose. Creatures whose constitutions are different have different ends and functions accordingly. So, for creatures whose constitution is exclusively designed for use, use on its own suffices. But where the capacity to understand that use is added, the creature will only reach its end by bringing that capacity into play. God created some beasts to be eaten, some to be used in farming, some to supply us with cheese, and so on. To fulfill such functions, they don't need to comprehend impressions or make distinctions among them. Man was brought into the world, however, to look upon God and his works, and not just look, but appreciate. And so it is inexcusable for man to begin and end where the beasts do. He should begin where they do, but only end where nature left off dealing with him which is to say, in contemplation and understanding, and a manner of life otherwise adapted to his nature. Come to look upon and appreciate God's works at least once before you die. You eagerly travel to Olympia to see the work of Phidias, and all of you are counted a shame to die never having seen the sight. But when there is no need even to travel, when you are already there because God is present everywhere in his works, don't you want to look at and try to understand them? Will you never come to a realization of who you are, what you have been born for, and the purpose for which the gift of vision was made in our case? But difficult and disagreeable things happen in life. Well, aren't difficulties found at Olympia? Don't you get hot and crowded? Isn't bathing a problem? Don't you get soaked through in your seats when it rains? Don't you finally get sick of the noise, the shouting, and the other irritations? I can only suppose that you weigh all those negatives against the worth of the show and choose, in the end, to be patient and put up with it all. Furthermore, you have inner strength that enable you to bear up with difficulties of every kind. You have been given fortitude, courage, and patience. Why should I worry about what happens if I am armed with the virtue of fortitude? 
Nothing can trouble or upset me, or even seem annoying. Instead of meeting misfortune with groans and tears, I will call upon the faculty especially provided to deal with it. But my nose is running. What do you have hands for, idiot, if not to wipe it? But how is it right that there be running noses in the first place? Instead of thinking up protests, wouldn't it be easier just to wipe your nose? What would have become of Hercules, do you think, if there had been no lion, hydra, stag or boar, and no savage criminals to rid the world of? What would he have done in the absence of such challenges? Obviously, he would have just rolled over in bed and gone back to sleep. So, by snoring his life away in luxury and comfort, he never would have developed into the mighty Hercules. And even if he had, what good would it have done him? What would have been the use of those arms, that physique and that noble soul, without crises or conditions to stir him into action? In that case, perhaps he should have created them himself by searching for a lion to bring into his land, and a boar and a hydra. That would have been the act of a fool and a fanatic. Still, by showing up and being discovered, they proved useful as tests of Hercules' manhood. Now that you know all this, come and appreciate the resources you have. And when that is done, say, bring on whatever difficulties you like, I have resources and a constitution that you gave me by means of which I can do myself credit, whatever happens. But no. There you sit, worrying that certain events might happen, already upset and in a state about your present circumstances. So then you reproach God. What else can come of such weakness except impiety? And yet God has not merely given us strength to tolerate troubles without being humiliated or undone, but as befitted a king and true father, he has given them to us free from constraint, compulsion, and impediment. He has put the whole matter in our control. And even though you have these powers free and entirely your own, you don't use them because you still don't realize what you have or where it came from. Instead, you sit crying and complaining, some of you blind to your benefactor and unable to acknowledge his existence, others assailing God with complaints and accusations from sheer meanness of spirit. I am prepared to show you that you have resources and a character naturally strong and resilient. Show me, in return, what grounds you have for being peevish and malcontent. <laughs>